Okay. Cool. So we have only two more lectures left. I guess today for two hours and tomorrow for four hours. You're looking forward to the end of this. Okay. Well, hopefully it will go well. Uh, this is a topic that will require more than two hours probably, but let's see how far we get. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll improvise. Clearly, we're not going to be able to cover all of the topics that I listed uh, early on when we started the lectures. But now we made it up to low latency. I think processing in memory is one way of reducing latency. You're reducing uh, the uh, distance uh, from the data, basically. Distance of the computation is from the data. That's one way of reducing latency clearly. But what I'm going to describe here is going to be an orthogonal way of reducing latency. And if you really want to reduce latency, if you really want to be data centric, which means that you want low latency, low energy access to data, you, I think you want computation units closer to data as well as very fast memory units. And this is going to be about faster memory units. And remember, these are the four key directions that we've been talking about. Now we're going to focus a lot more on low latency. And I think you've seen this before many times. I don't know why the picture is missing. This is an old version of the slide. But there's Maslow smiling at you over there. <laughs> and I will argue that speed may be everything in the end. It's very important. And it's amazing, actually. Uh, in the early 1980s, when processors are being designed, uh, some, uh, there was MIPS uh, R2000. Does anybody know that processor? MIPS processor R2000? It's a very low performance processor, a very short pipeline. I think two stage pipeline, actually, at that time. Maybe four stage, five stage. I don't remember exact version of R2000. But people were saying, this is the greatest processor. Why do we need higher performance in the world? <laughs> you will always get people like that, I think, in my opinion, saying that why do we need higher performance? But whenever higher performance comes, you always enable new things, new applications. Like nobody could have imagined, perhaps, I mean, some people could have imagined, I think, but it's, uh, uh, definitely those people who said, why do we need high performance, didn't imagine how that high performance enabled all of this machine learning today. The machine learning, the neural networks that people are designing today couldn't have been enabled if we actually didn't push for high performance and the GPUs didn't come about and you didn't have that much processing power. That's why speed is very important, I think. It could, it, I don't know if, this is of course a joke, right, an analogy. It's not clear if speed will help you with energy needs or security needs fully. But certainly to enable many, many things over here, you need speed. And that's why we want to focus on low latency. And I think low latency, latency is something that's been ignored a lot in computing. Uh, even though processor performance has increased, latencies have not reduced. And this talk is, uh, this lecture is about some fundamental trade-offs in latency. And let me first review this slide. I'll go through this quickly. Clearly, DRAM chips are designed for capacity. Their bandwidth is not terrible, but their latency is really not improving. And it's actually reducing in some of the standards uh, and I mentioned that paper yesterday that we, that we have in Sigmetrics, showing that some standards, some DRAM standards want low power at the expense of latency. Other DRAM standards, that's LPDDR4, for example. Some DRAM standards provide you high bandwidth at the expense of higher latency. As a result, if you use those in applications that require low latency, you actually lose performance compared to the, a path generation DRAM. So even though this is improving in DDR, this is just DDR, this doesn't look at GDDR, for example. Uh, this is actually, if you, if you look at some, uh, some other uh, DRAM that's designed for bandwidth, for example, or low power, this is actually increasing. Okay, well, it remains almost constant if you average out uh, across many generations. But latency is actually critical for performance, and we know that for many applications, you get a performance bottleneck. Okay, so what is the problem, basically? Uh, memory latency is a significant limiter of system performance and also energy efficiency, and I'll give you some results related to that. It's becoming increasingly important, actually, in our systems because contention in the systems is increasing because you have multiple applications interfering with each other uh, or multiple threads with multiple cores, multiple accelerators. They're actually interfering with each other, and uh, the long latencies are exacerbating the bandwidth need, and they're exacerbating the quality of service problem also. Because if you have long latency, at some point, you start queuing and your latency start increasing a lot. So in general, if you want a system that should not wait, you should get rid of the latency as much as possible from your system. That's basic queuing theory also, actually. If you, if you, if you increase the latencies, your queue length increase also. Okay, 
And also, there's one downside is it, it increased processor design complexity to, due to the mechanisms incorporated to tolerate memory latency. And we discussed this uh, from a uh, processor-centric perspective. Like if you don't do computation and memory, your processor design complexity increases because you have long latency. But even if, if we ignore the computation and memory part, if you have long latencies, your processor design complexity needs to be uh, high to tolerate that long latency. So this is true. If you're putting processors inside the logic layer, if your memory latency is very high, you may still need complex processors over there. Okay, I'll give you a slide that I presented first in my PhD proposal, actually. This is a slide from 2002, and I didn't change it at all. I used it later uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my defense as well. But basically, my, my P I'll also talk about my PhD a little bit because I'm proud of it. And you should all be proud of your PhD theses. <laughs> That's why you're doing a PhD, hopefully. Uh, but basically, uh, I tackled the memory latency problem in a different way uh, than I'm going to describe today. And these are the conventional latency tolerance techniques. And I think these are very fundamental. They have been all developed in 1960s, as you can see. Uh, caching, of course, it's very widely used. But of course, we know that not all applications benefit from caching. And if they don't benefit, caching actually adds latency. Because you have uh, levels of caches and you have to go through them one by one to actually figure out that you're actually missing all of them, and eventually you go to memory, and caching is actually very harmful for latency if the application doesn't benefit. Prefetching, of course, tries to hide the latencies, which is a good idea. You try to prefetch the data before, you, before the processor accesses it, access it, and people actually are developing more prefetching algorithms. I think it's a very promising direction going forward. But unfortunately, it's not easy, basically, especially if your access patterns are irregular or random, for example. How do you build a prefetcher for that? Now we're gonna see some prefetchers are execution based. They can capture some of those random patterns, but this is not an easy problem. Multi-threading, clearly it was developed in the 1960s first. Uh, and this is hardware multi-threading. Basically you can switch between multiple contexts very quickly, every cycle. Uh, and this work, uh, GPUs do that, for example. They do fine-grained multi-threading. Every cycle they switch between different sets of threads. Uh, and this is good for tolerating latency if you have multiple threads. If your application can be divided into many threads, you tolerate latency by switching between them. You don't care about the performance of a single thread, you care about the aggregate throughput of how many threads you finish. If that's the case, this is great. If that's not the case, if you care the, about the performance of a single thread, then there's a problem, right? Multi-threading doesn't help you, and people actually have to try to develop techniques to improve single thread performance using multi-threading hardware. If you have a single thread, single threaded program, how do you parallelize it automatically so that you make use of the multi-thread hardware to improve or reduce the latency of that single thread. But this is not an easy problem, actually. It turns out people have been working on this problem also for 30 years, and I know of no processors that actually do this at this point. Out of order execution, clearly you execute instructions out of the original program order, and then you report the results in program order. That's a great idea. That was developed early on, and again in 1960s. Um, this is good because this is very good for exploiting irregular parallelism. This is basically data flow inside the hardware, except it's not at the ISA level, it's at the microarchitecture level, right? Um, it tolerates cache misses that cannot be prefetched because what you're doing is you're overlapping the latency of one cache miss with another cache miss. Now, the downside is if your latencies are long, you need a lot of hardware resources to make it, to build a very big out of order execution engine. And when I was actually doing my PhD, this was a hot topic. People were trying to build these very big out-of-order execution engines. Uh, we took a different approach, I will tell you about that. But before I tell you that, what approach we took, I think none of these approaches really fundamentally reduce the memory latency, if you think about them, right? They're really trying to tolerate. Memory is far away, so okay, let's not go to memory. Right? Caching does that. Prefetching says, okay, let's bring the data early on so that all of that latency we don't see, the processor doesn't see that. Multi-threading uh, also says, okay, memory latency is long, so we're actually go get, we're going to generate a lot of threads and overlap the latencies. Auto vertical execution also overlaps the latencies. Basically, none of them really fundamentally solve the problem, including my thesis, which I will talk about briefly, and then we're gonna jump into how to fundamentally solve the problem. Basically, from my point of view, the, all of this is really uh, a processor-centric approach. You basically are trying to bring the data to the processor. They reduce the latency from the perspective of the processor, right? Hopefully the processor sees fast access in the caches. Uh, processor doesn't see latency to memory, 
with all of these approaches or tolerate the latency. But the latency is still there. Somebody, the latency needs to be, um, uh, the, the data needs to be brought with that latency into the processor or into some of these structures. That's why I say these, none of these fundamentally reduce the memory latency. Now let me tell you what I did in my PhD thesis because I really like this idea and I think actually this idea is applicable to in-memory comput computation also. Uh, I actually pointed out a paper yesterday uh, by Milat uh, who did his thesis uh, in 2016 that actually does run ahead execution in the memory controllers. I'll give you the basic idea. This is essentially what I wanted to do is to, it, it was a processor centric approach. Basically, ideally if you're processor centric you want perfect caches, right? You don't want to see any latency. You get a, a load, it hits in the cache, you keep computing, you never stall essentially. Your perfect caches always provide the data. But in real life, what you get is a small out of order instruction window, which means that you compute, you get a cache miss. Well, because, because you couldn't avoid that cache miss even with all of these techniques that you employ. And then the processor executes a little bit ahead because it, can, it has some buffering that enables it to execute out of order. It can actually uh, some execute some instructions, but it cannot finish those instructions. It has to stop at some point because it runs out of buffering. Make sense? That load becomes the oldest instruction and the buffers become full. And at that point, the processor cannot do anything and it stalls for a long time. And remember, I showed you why uh, the processor stalls uh, when we talked about, uh, when, when we motivated processing in memory. This is essentially the cause of a lot of the stalls. You get a cache miss, the processor doesn't have enough buffering to continue, so it stalls. So the stall ends when the cache miss comes back and then the processor computes until the next cache miss. And then during the next cache miss, it computes a little bit more and then it stalls, uh, the, the window becomes full, the buffers become full and it stalls for a long time. This doesn't look good, right? Most of the time you're stalling in, if this is the case. So the idea that uh, we proposed in my thesis is essentially called run head execution and it's a way of not stalling. But during not stalling, you do something. What does that mean? So you get a cache miss. Soon after, the window becomes full, the buffers become full, and then you now realize that it's going to take a long time. Uh, as opposed to stalling, you go into a special mode called run ahead mode. This is a speculative mode. Basically, you checkpoint the architectural state, checkpoint the register file, program counter, because you're gonna go back to it, and keep processing instructions in the special mode. You may not have some values in there because you missed in the cache, you don't know what the values are. You mark them specially saying these are bogus values and you don't use them. But you have some other values that you can compute with and those values hopefully lead to the second load miss if the second load is independent of the first load. And you execute them speculatively completely and you generate the cache miss and while uh, now you parallelize part of this miss with this miss. Right? And at some point, the load one miss returns. You say, okay, I'm gonna flush the pipeline. I've executed speculatively. I shouldn't have done all of that really. Uh, but I'm gonna flush the pipeline that incurs some penalty and restart from executing load one and fill the pipeline again. And while you're doing that, now you're computing. At some point, second miss, which you've started speculatively over here, finishes. And when you actually really reach load two in real execution, you get a cache hit which means that you don't need to wait for that stall, which means that you save a lot of cycles. Right? That's the idea basically. Instead of stalling for every cache miss, you speculatively execute the program with the values that you have, the available values, and those available values enable the generation of other cache misses that you couldn't otherwise get because you were stalling, but now you can parallelize those cache misses. And this is a very simple way because you don't need to increase the instruction window size that much. You can effectively tolerate the latency of cache misses. Of course, it doesn't always work as you can see, right? If the second miss is dependent on the first miss, this is not going to work. If the distance between misses is too far, it's not going to work very well. And my thesis solved some of those problems basically. And of course, you can say that it's not very energy efficient and that's true. So we tried to make it much more energy efficient also. Okay. So this is actually one way of tolerating latencies, but again, this is not fundamentally reducing latency, right? This latency remains the same over here. We didn't change that latency. We really tried to overlap the latency so that the processor is not affected much by that latency. So what is this by you? This actually, I mean, we have a lot of results, obviously, I'll reference the papers, but this was implemented in uh, Sunrock. It's also implemented in IMD, uh, IBM Power 6. 
But I like this presentation because Sun, while they were implementing it, they actually did give, gave a lot of presentation and wrote a lot of papers. They called it the scout, scout threads. Essentially scouting ahead and finding out the cache misses, right? We called it run ahead. Uh, so they basically said if, if you have a small cache, you can get significantly better performance with run ahead. Or another alternative is, uh, as opposed, uh, instead of building a large cache, uh, like I think in this case, eight megabyte cache, if you want to get that level of performance, you can save seven megabytes of cache and have one, one megabyte of cache and run ahead on top of that. So you can save real estate if you want to have equal performance uh, or you can uh, get better power, uh, better performance. So that's the idea basically. And these are workloads that are commercial workloads that someone was designing its processors with at the time. Okay, so if you're interested, there's a lot more detail, of course, in our papers. And this is the first paper that we wrote in HPCA 2003. And this is a shorter version of it. If you don't have time, you can read the six page version. That's a, that's a summary, better written, I think. You always write better after some time. Uh, and these are some of the other papers that solve the problems associated with the, uh, with the original idea. Original idea is not very efficient, so how do you make it much more efficient? Uh, original idea cannot, is not able to parallelize cache misses that are dependent on each other. How do you uh, enable that parallelization of dependent cache misses? Uh, this, I like this idea a lot, actually. It's, it tries to exploit the regular memory allocation patterns to do the prediction of the address for a depend, uh, that's dependent on a previous address. It doesn't work in all cases, of course, but if your memory addresses are laid out nicely, uh, it works nice. And also, if, you're, if you actually go in the wrong path while you're doing this run-ahead execution, how do you actually recover from that? So there are a lot of interesting ideas uh, that spun out of this. Okay, any questions? I'm, I'm always fascinated talking about my thesis, so <laughs> I can go on, on and on. Hopefully you will be also. So yes, how please. How many misses that you can recover? Oh, how many misses? Yeah, so we have a lot of analyses in this paper, basically. Our original analysis, this paper, uh, was based on, actually we did partly with Intel folks. Uh, it was based on a Pentium 4-like processors at the time, and we showed that uh, with the realistic latencies, uh, you can capture about 2.4 more misses that couldn't have been captured by the out-of-order processor. That's a lot of misses actually, on average across, uh, I think, 147 workloads. Yes? What's the port? 40 bit range? Yes, so that's a great question. Basically, you're asking what is the accuracy of prefetching, right? It turns out this is very, very accurate. Uh, I think the numbers that we quoted in this paper, and it's also in other papers, it's more than 93%. Yeah, because what you're really doing is you're following the program path. Uh, on, the only cases where you, you, you're not accurate is you, you get out of the program path because your branch predictor told you some, uh, you, you mispredicted a branch, so you go on the wrong path. And we did a lot of analysis on what happens on the wrong path. Most of the time, if you're on the wrong path, actually you prefetch useful data uh, if you're executing on the wrong path. But the be uh, not always, of course. That's why you get very high accuracy in this prefetching. And, but your coverage is not necessarily high because coverage depends on how far you prefetch. And you may not always get that far. It depends on your memory latency. Okay, cool. These are very good questions. Okay, so okay, let me go back over here. Basically, including what I just described, none of the past approaches really fundamentally reduce memory latency. And later we realized that we should really re fundamentally reduce memory latency as much as possible. These toleration methods, they're good, I think but they're still from the processor-centric paradigm. Uh, so what, how do we fundamentally reduce latency? I'm going to sh show you two different uh, directions. Th and there are two major sources of latency and efficiency in existing systems. First of all, modern memory, DRAM especially, is not designed for low latency. Uh, the main focus is really cost per bit, as we've seen in that slide, it's capacity. So how do we change it so that we incorporate latency into it without increasing the cost a lot? Uh, the second is modern DRAM latency is determined by worst case conditions and worst case devices. Essentially, uh, you're, uh, they assume that you're operating memory at very high temperatures and you have a worst case device. Basically, there's a lot of process variation and you try to maximize yield in the presence of that huge process variation. As a result, you're really very conservative in setting the timing parameters of memory 
And as a result of that, much of memory latency is really unnecessary. I'm going to quantify what is, what is that much of memory latency. This is, of course, dependent on the device as well, but let's see. So the goal is really to reduce the memory latency at the source of the problem, which is really the memory itself, or the design of the memory itself, or the specification of the memory itself. So then the key question is, what causes the long memory latency? Uh, the first reason comes from directly from one of the inefficiencies. It's the design of the DRM microarchitecture. The goal is to maximize capacity per air, uh, area, not to minimize latency. So we're going to try to fix that in the first half of this lecture. The second half, the second reason is basically we have a one-size-fits-all approach to latency specification. When we specify the latency of DRAM for a timing parameter, we use the same latency parameters for all temperatures, regardless of what temperature. You may be operating at zero degrees Celsius, and you're still using the latency that's specified for 85 degrees Celsius. And that 85 degrees Celsius latency is very, very conservative. So you can be operating much faster at zero degrees Celsius, actually. Uh, and for all DRAM chips, we have the same latency parameters. For all parts of a DRAM chip, we have the same latency parameters. All supply voltage levels, all application data, and you could keep extending it, and those could actually lead to some other ideas if you keep extending it. Basically, we have this very conservative specification, and we're going to target that in the second half of the lecture. So let's start with this one, first one. Uh, but let me actually do a brief review of the DRAM chip so that everybody is uh, fresh. And I, I'm going to use different slides than what we've used. Uh, these are actually slides that Vivek Sashadri uh, made, and I think he's good at making these slides. Uh, I don't think I could have done better. <laughs> he, Vivek is my student, and he's also the co-author of this paper that I mentioned that I recommend that I'm going to say, say that uh, later. Basically, if you look at a DRAM chip, DRAM module, it looks like this, and that's the DRAM chip. Now you can see the array bank structure over here, right? There are eight banks in this chip. You can easily see, and you can see the peripheral logic and I.O. There are many goals in designing this chip, actually. Cost, latency, bandwidth, parallels, and power, energy, reliability, and they're all important. Usually, DRM manufacturers try to maximize cost with some reliability and yield guarantee. Of course, they cannot ignore all of the other ones, but there some of them are less important, and latency is definitely much less important compared to many others over here. So let's go inside the DRM chip a little bit. So if you look at a DRM chip, this is one bank, and you can see the uh, subarray structure. This is the one subarray. Uh, of course, this is... Uh, uh, zooming out, it doesn't show the small subarray over here. It shows two subarrays. The real life is actually there are many subarrays inside here, uh, and row decoder and sense amplifiers and the bank I/O. Let's start from the bottom up. So if you look at the, start from the bottom up, what does a sense amplifier look like? Essentially, it's two cross couple inverters. It's like an SRAM cell. It has a top and bottom, and it has an enable signal. Uh, and uh, there are two stable states of the sense amplifier. This is, assume that this is a logical one. You get VDD on the top and zero on the bottom, and logical zero is exactly opposite of it. So how does this operate? Basically, if the sense amplifier is disabled, nothing happens. These don't uh, operate. Basically, if the sense amplifier is, assume that VT, top voltage is higher than the bottom voltage, when you enable the sense amplifier, what it does is it amplifies VT to uh, high voltage and VB to zero because VT is greater than VB. Right? This is what you get when you enable the sense amplifier. That's why you can sense what's happening in the bit line over here. You can do the exact opposite also clearly, right? If this is higher than this, you get VDD over here and zero over here when you enable the sense amplifier. Okay, and DRAM cell, we've seen this before. This is the empty state, it's the logical zero. Fully charged state, it's the logical one. Now the key realization is that you want to make this as small as possible so they can pack many, many cells. And it's, as a result, this is small. It cannot really drive circuits. And reading destroys a state. So how do you actually sense the value that's inside the capacitor? Uh, essentially, you would like to be able to sense this to be a zero, and you'd like the, uh, to be able to sense this to be a VDD. So you connect the uh, cell to the sense amplifier through a bit line. And initially, the bit line is precharged to half VDD, and the sense amplifier is in half VDD, and this is not enabled. Now, when you connect uh, the cell to the bit line, the very little charge over here perturbs uh, the bit line. So you get one and a half VDD plus some epsilon. And that epsilon, yeah, that's, I guess in this case, delta. Is that delta? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know why it's not epsilon. <laughs> okay, that's a delta. Uh, now, what happens is, uh, you, you, this, this gets perturbed, and at, the, at some point, sense amplifier gets enabled. There's actually self-timing inside the DM circuit. This gets enabled. Uh, 
And once this gets enabled, you know that this is larger than this one, and the sense of our senses that difference and drives uh, the bit line to VDD and drives the bit line bar to zero. And during the process, clearly when you drive this to VDD, this is not going to stay constant because the voltage, the charge moves inside and fills the capacitor. And that's how you actually refresh the circuit. Whenever you activate, you actually are refreshing uh, the cell. Okay, so that's a cell. You knew this operation before, but it's good to go through this again, uh, especially from this bottom-up perspective. And let's take a look at how do we actually build a subray out of the cell. This is a single cell and a SEM amplifier. Basically, you put many sense amplifiers, uh, many cells, uh, to, to get connected to the bit line. Uh, and this, uh, of course, you could have had uh, one sense amplifier per cell, but that would be very inefficient because this is actually the size of this is huge. The size of a sense amplifier is hundred times the size of a cell. It's getting more and more in existing chips. So to amortize the cost, you put many, many. Uh, cells on a bit line. Of course, that's not the whole story. It's, the cell, uh, the horizontal cell is not a single cell. It's really connected to an entire row. So I have these word lines and then bit lines, and that's how you get this two-dimensional structure. And then the sense of fires in between. Okay? And you have the enable signal for the sense of fires, and then you have a row decoder. And then you have an array of sense of fires. It depends on the DRAM chip. It could be eight kilobits and then the cell arrays. This is the same subarray in this case. Some of the cells are connected to the bit line, top of the sense amplifier. Some of the cells are connected to the bottom of the sense amplifier to the bit line bar. And they may encode data differently as a result. Anyway, so this, this is a DRAM bank. It consists of multiple of these subarrays. In this case, I show two, but it's really 128 or so uh, subarrays, maybe more. And then you have the peripheral circuitry, which is the bank IO circuitry. This is much smaller. Because whenever, uh, as we discussed last time, the interconnect from the cell array to the sense amplifiers is short in this case, right? This is designed with some to, to ensure that that interconnect is short. But if you want to get the data out of the sense amplifiers and drive it out of the chip, you need very long interconnects. And those interconnects need to be powerful and wide. As a result, you can only drive a small number of bits uh, out of the sense amplifiers into the IO circuitry to outside. Uh, of course, you need to supply the address, it gets decoded, and you need to supply the column address so that you, you get which uh, decide which column to get. Okay, if you look at a chip, the channel is not wide. It's eight bits, as we've discussed. And the chip consists of all of these subarrays, as you can see. This is one bank with two subarrays in this particular example, and you have eight banks here. And you have the bank I.O. Uh, circuitries that are on the periphery, if, if you will. And there's a shared internal bus that's 64 bits wide something very small. We will see that bus that becomes a bottleneck. Uh, so, so operation, you've seen this operation before, but I'm going to go through it very quickly again. So whenever you want to access a cell over here or a column over here, you need to activate the row that houses that cell, which means that you need to activate the row in that subarray, in that bank actually. And activation basically brings the row into the sense amplifiers, local sense amplifiers in that subarray. And then the next step is to read and write the column, which basically sends the address, the column address, to over there, and then that gets muxed out and into the bank I.O. and outside the chip. Now, once you're done with all of the read and write that you're doing to that particular row, you pre-charge the array, which means that set all of the bit lines in, the, uh, in, in here to VDD over two. So you're really dealing with that subarray, right? All of these should be VDD over two anyway, uh, because you didn't touch these. Okay, so that's, now we reviewed uh, bottom-up uh, DRAM, uh, DRAM internals a little bit more. Was this useful? Okay, we're gonna use that more, I think. I like this explanation very much, actually. Uh, it can be improved a little bit more, but if you want to look at the improved version, this section two in this paper actually ha does a really good job of uh, DRAM operation internally. Okay, okay, so now that we have that background, let's take a look at uh, why the design of DRM microarchitecture leads to high latencies and how can we alleviate uh, those high latencies? Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, the first idea. It's called tiered latency DRM. Uh, it's, it's in my, uh, as far as I've seen, this is the first work that provides a low cost approach to low latency, getting low latency in DRM. I'm going to also talk about some of the high cost approaches while we talk about this. So what the, the key question we asked was what causes the long latency uh, in DRM? 
basically, I'm going to abstract the DRAM chip that I showed you to into a cell array and the I.O. circuitry and the channel. And you've seen the subarrays internally. Uh, this is a cartoonish picture that shows three subarrays. Basically, you have some access latency to access the subarray, and you have some I.O. latency after that. Right. Now, you can abstractly write this equation, DRAM latency, subarray latency plus I.O. latency. And we're going to assert that this is dominant. You can actually play a lot of tricks with the I.O. latency, like do a lot of prefetching internally, which uh, actual chips do uh, to tolerate that latency. This is not to say that this is not important, uh, but this is actually a bigger fraction of the latency, it turns out, how fast you can access the subarray. So why is that? Why is the subarray access latency so slow? This is another picture of what we've seen. This is a subarray. Uh, this is a cell. And uh, the size of the cell, you, this is not correct, actually, over here, as you can see. Actually, the size of the sense amplifier is much larger than the size of the cell uh, because it needs to sense that really little charge perturbation coming out of this very small cell. As a result, the size of this is, let's say, 100 times more than the uh, size of a sense amplifier. Now, if you have this trade-off, uh, what the DRAM manufacturers do is uh, they don't put a lot of sense amplifiers in their chip. They basically put only enough sense amplifiers to, uh, basically, they, they amortize the sense amplifier cost by stringing together many cells on a bit line, like we've described. Now, this amortizes the sense amplifier cost. It leads to smaller area because you don't have a lot of sense amplifiers. But it also leads to a large capacitance on this bit line. And as a result, it leads to high latency and power because now you have a long interconnect. Right? Of course, they don't make it the interconnect unreasonably large. Then the latencies will become even higher. But they make it large enough that the latency is still a problem. And also power becomes a problem as well in that interconnect. OK, so basically, this points to a key trade-off between area or die size versus latency. This is the long bit line architecture. You may have a lot of cells on a single bit line, very few sense amplifiers. If you want to make it faster, there is a very clear path. You chop it off. You chop off the bit lines, as we've done over here, and add more sense amplifiers. Now, this, you can see that the area already increased over here, and I didn't have 100 times the size sense amplifier. This actually exists. You can buy DRAM that does exactly this. It's called reduced latency DRAM, or fast cycling DRAM. It's manufactured at very low volumes, uh, low vol volumes because it's very high cost. There are some customers that buy it, especially those who are very sensitive to latency, like the core routers uh, in networking. They, they buy actually RLDRAM so that they can do very fast packet switching in the, in, uh, in the core routers of the internet. But these are very, very expensive. I don't think this is a very good approach to reducing latency, but it is one approach, and it's, it's done today. Clearly, if you want smaller, you don't want to go that route. So how do you actually come up with a good trade-off in between? There's, this, is, this is a very fundamental trade-off. I think that's very hard to break. So let's take a look at an example of uh, this trade-off. We've done these studies. Uh, this is the latency you get, and this is the normalized DRM area you get, depending on the length of your subarray, how many bits um, you have in, in your bit line, how many cells you have in the bit line. Clearly, if you want to go cheaper, you want to be here. If you want to go faster, you want to be here. So ideally, you want to be somewhere here. But you see that there's a trade-off curve, and there are some, uh, yeah, it's a trade-off in the end. So commodity DRAM makes a trade-off at 512 or 120, 1,024 cells per bit line. As a result, you get high latencies, but also low area. This normalized to commodity DRAM. And if you keep reducing the sub-A uh, bit line length, this is the curve you get. So if you want to do 32, the DRAM area increases significantly. Of course, there is, this, is, this is, again, based on a model. So it's not perfect, but the curve usually looks like this. It may be worse, or it may, be, it may go this way, or it may go this way, depending on how you design some of the circuits. So this is fancy DRAM. This is our LDRM that I mentioned, reduced latency DRAM. It, it, you can buy it, but you, pay, you need to pay an arm and leg for it. It's, you need to have deep, deep pockets if you want that. So our goal is to actually achieve somewhere over here. So how do we do that? Basically, if you want to approximate the best of both worlds, there is no magic, as far as I know. So the idea in this work is, uh, OK, this is long bit line, small area, high latency. This is short bit line, low latency, large area. Whenever you see such a picture like this, a good way of compromising is really coming up with a heterogeneous solution. Because you have two different things that are good at uh, complementary things, complementary metrics. And maybe you create heterogeneity in the system. And heterogeneity in the system can be created in multiple ways. Maybe you have some subarrays that are like this, some subarrays that are like this. 
That's an interesting one, which we're going to get back to, actually. Keep that in mind. Some subarrays are like this, some subarrays are like this, and this, these subarrays are fast, these subarrays are slow, and you map your data such that the slow sub, uh, uh, frequently accessed data is in uh, these fast subarrays. We're going to get back to that, uh, examine that idea, and that was actually proposed. Uh, we referenced that in some of the later papers because that was proposed later than what I'm going to describe in a little bit. So the proposal in this work is to actually start with this one. That gets you a small area, but we don't want the high latency of it. So how do we actually create some trade-off inside it? The idea is to create a portion that is low latency, that looks like this. How do you do that? Basically, you segment the bit line. You essentially add some isolation transistors in the bit line that you can control. What does this mean? This means that, uh, okay, let's take a look at this. is called tiered latency DRM. There are two portions. This is called the near segment. This is called the far segment. You get the small area using the long bit line. This is low latency. Whenever you want to access some data inside this near segment, you turn off the isolation transistor such that this bit line looks short. You don't have all of this capacitance, basically. And the memory controller does that. Whenever you need to access something over here, you turn on the access transistors. Uh, maybe isolation transistors, and now your bit line is longer. That's the idea over here. It's a simple idea. The cost is these additional transistors and the ability to uh, control them. It turns out to be, it's not a simple thing to do actually, but it's not terrible also. It's much cheaper than uh, completely going to this version basically. Okay, so let's take a look at uh, the results a little bit. This is uh, the latency in terms of row cycling time, back-to-back -back activates, how long does it take? This, um, this is actually 56% reduction in the near segment. So the near segment gives you a 56% reduction. Ignore the bar, the bar is wrong actually. <laughs> the bar should be for, at 44 over here. Uh, I corrected this in one of the slides, but uh, this keeps coming back because there are so many versions of these slides that I always pick the wrong version. <laughs> and this is not an easy thing to fix. <laughs> I should probably create a small uh, patch that's white that covers that part. <laughs> anyway. But basically, you reduce the near segment latency by 56%. The, the unfortunate thing is far segment latency actually increases compared to commodity DRAM because you have these isolation transistors. And whenever you access far segment, you need to enable those isolation transistors, which means that you have increased capacitance and resistance in the uh, bit line. That's why you have this trade-off. But now you have a choice. You can put your data here. And hopefully, if it's frequently accessed, you can get very, very, very low latency compared to commodity DRAM. And the other benefit over here is you get reduced power. Whenever you're accessing near segment, your power is reduced uh, by half. But of course, whenever you're accessing far segment, the power is increased. So you have a trade-off again. And the area overhead, according to our results, uh, is about 3%. These isolation transistors actually consume a lot of area, it turns out, to, to operate reliably. OK, so let's take a look at where we are in terms of the trade-off between area and latency. Ideally, we want it to be here, and we're not going to get there. And if you come up with a mechanism that gets there, let me know. As long as you're not doing magic, I'll be very interested. <laughs> but I think it's very, it could be magic. <laughs> uh, so near segment actually breaks uh, this curve, clearly, because we architected it that way. But far segment actually takes us back over here. Uh, and the area cost is about 3% higher. It's not visible here, essentially. Now we have a trade-off. Ideally, you would like your data to be accessed from the rear segment as much as possible while avoiding the far segment as much as possible. So it's essentially a substrate now that can be leveraged by the hardware and the software. There are many potential use cases. We explored some of them in the paper. Uh, I'm going to give you results with the simplest, dumbest, easiest to explore case. It's not the best uh, benefits, but I think even this improves performance, as you will see. Essentially, the idea is to use the near segment as a hardware-managed inclusive cache to the far segment. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll see that. Or you can, you can use the near segment as a hardware managed exclusive cache, meaning that uh, you, don't, uh, you don't duplicate the data in the near segment, but you really swap the data between the near and far segment. That actually preserves the capacity of memory for you, but there's a more overhead over there. This is also interesting. We explore that in the paper. Or you basically punt the problem to the software. The software somehow figures out which pages are accessed more frequently and those frequently accessed pages are moved, migrated to the fast segment once in a while. I think this is a very good approach also, uh, but we didn't explore it as much in this particular work. Uh, 
In some other later works, actually, we showed better results with this one, but I'm not going to talk about them. Or you could do simply replace DRAM with TLDRAM and do, not do anything. Uh, of course, you need to change the memory controller to adapt the latencies, right? Now, if you do this, you don't gain much, basically. Magically, your pages that are frequently accessed, they don't get magically mapped uh, to the near segment. You need to put some effort uh, to uh, map uh, frequently accessed or recently accessed pages to, uh, to the near segment. So these are explored in the paper in more detail. Let's take a look at this one. Uh, essentially, near segment is a hardware managed cache, basically. If you look at a subarray, a subarray is divided into two segments. Well, there's, of course, a sense amplifier, uh, but a near segment, far segment, as you can see over there. And the near segment, uh, far segment is your main memory, and near segment is really your cache in this case. You can think of it that way abstractly. So you're losing a little bit of your main memory capacity if you use it that way, but hopefully you're getting a lot of benefit over here. So there are, of course, many questions over here. How do you efficiently migrate a row between the, the segments? Actually, we've seen the idea of row clone. It's going to be very similar to that. And the second one is, how do you efficiently manage the cache? Uh, let's take a look at this first challenge relatively quickly. Essentially, the goal is to migrate, uh, whenever you access a far segment uh, row, uh, let's assume you have a caching policy, and the caching policy says, whenever I access a far segment row, I would like to bring it into the near segment in anticipation that I'm gonna access that row again, and the next access to the row will be quicker. Right. So the naive way, of course, memory control reads the source row byte by byte and writes the destination row byte by byte. That's not good, that takes a lot of time. So uh, we developed another way uh, essentially, source and destination share the bit lines, as we've seen in row clone. So you can directly connect these. But another way of actually doing that is transfer data uh, from source to destination across the shared bit lines. So how do we do that? Basically, this is a source row. This is the destination row. You first activate the source row, which brings the data into the sense amplifiers. And then you activate the destination row. It's very similar to row clone, except it's done while the isolation transistors uh, are turned on over here. But it's not used for page copy in this case. This is mainly used for essentially caching. Uh, you have this uh, slow memory and fast memory, and you're basically moving a row from the slow memory and uh, fast memory. Okay, and this is very fast, as you know already. The second question is how do you manage the cache? Well, there are many, many cache management policies here, obviously, right? Uh, and uh, the simplest one is whenever you access a row in the far segment, you migrate the data or you copy the data into the near segment. Always. This is found the least recently used policy. Essentially, uh, you have some number of rows in the near segment. You evict the least recently used ones, and you replace them with the most recently accessed uh, far segment row. I don't think this is the best policy. This is actually shown to be a really bad policy whenever you have multiple applications sharing uh, a cache uh, because it prioritizes applications that are more friendly to this least recently used policy, right, as you know. Uh, but, it, but if you're gonna show results with that one even, I think there, there needs to be more policies that are developed, especially the caches that are out in DRAM. And this is, you can consider this, this as an in-DRAM cache, right? This is really a cache that you're building inside your DRAM. Uh, those caches, I think, need different management policies uh, to be much, much more effective. Because the locality characteristics that you have in your L1 are very different from the locality characteristics that you have far, far, far into the memory because locality gets filtered out at every level of caching. You have some other level of locality that's over here. And also you have sharing from different applications. Anyway, let me give you the result with the dumbest cache policy, which is the LRU. And the results look good. Uh, they're not great in the sense that they're not 2x. They're more than 10% improvement, uh, which is, uh, but it's average across many applications and it's consistent across systems. So you get 10% improvement in terms of uh, performance average across those applications. And the, uh, no, this is memory power. Memory power also reduces uh, significantly. It's more than 20%, which is also good, I think. So of course, take these with a grain of salt. I think, there needs, uh, I think the potential of this idea is actually bigger than what the results in the paper suggest, in my opinion. Uh, okay. And of course, uh, there, there's more analysis in the paper. I'm not gonna go through this in a lot of detail, but you can imagine how many near segment rows do you allocate? Do you allocate one or 256? Of course, there's a trade-off because if you allocate one, your cache is smaller, but you're not wasting a lot of memory capacity. And also your bit line length is uh, shorter in the near segment. 
So you get larger cache capacity as you have more rows in the near segment, but you also get higher cache access latency. So there's a trade-off. And there's also a capacity loss as you go to the right. So ideally, you would like to be somewhere over here. And our results show that the maximum IPC improvement comes when you have 32 near segment rows and about 480 far segment rows. But even, even uh, for 8, uh, 16, they're also OK, as you can see, right? And surprisingly, one is pretty good. <laughs> right, if you have one uh, row over there, that actually turns out to be not bad. <laughs> It turns out you can actually, and the reason this works is actually you're tolerating bank conflicts, if you think about it. Right? You're really accessing a bank, and then you're activating a row. You're bringing it over here. Uh, you also have a sense amplifier, which is a row buffer, which is also a cache. Now you can actually access, uh, if, you're, if you're accessing two rows, A and B, one of them can be accessed from the sense amplifier, and the other can be accessed fast from the uh, cache, uh, the, the near segment cache. So the benefit of this part is really uh, that's why the caching policy needs to be more different over here. The caching policy is really designed to tolerate the bank conflicts that you have, uh, especially if you have a small uh, number of rows in the near segment. Okay. Well, it's obvious that by adjusting the near segment length, you can trade off cache capacity for cache latency. Okay. And this is the paper. Uh, any questions? Is this interesting? Yeah. I think this is interesting also. Uh, the prior works, uh, I will give you the results, but if you actually reduce the size of a cell, you increase the area significantly. Uh, and I think uh, there is a huge gap. Uh, let's assume that you have four levels of caching in your processor, processor-centric approach. Four levels of cache. The last level cache latency is still much, much shorter compared to the memory latency. So we have a huge gap between L4 and DRAM. And this is introducing another level, basically, in between, so that that latency is more smooth uh, from, from the L4 to DRAM. And later, actually, other people have proposed other caching, in DRAM caching mechanisms. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that. OK, so let me move on to something else. That's, uh, we're going to still our goal is to still reduce latency. But I'm going to introduce a substrate that enables multiple things at the same time. And uh, our approach has been also developing these substrates that can enable multiple things. Uh, I'm going to also talk about very briefly our upcoming ISCA paper that is another substrate that I believe is better than tiered latency DRAM. Uh, that's Hassan's work, and hopefully it'll be interesting. But let's talk, uh, talk about this one. I, I like this one also a lot because uh, I think the key message here is we want more interconnectivity in DRAM. If you want better memory, better latencies, better data movement, you want better interconnectivity. And I like this because uh, the, the current DRAM chips we're designing don't have a lot of interconnectivity. And I always like thinking about nature. I think nature has a lot of interconnectivity in the brain, for example. But the, the memory chips that we're designing don't have that interconnectivity. And if you don't put that, then we, there is a problem. OK, so one of the motivations for this work was this, basically. We, uh, we have a problem with mock data moment. And row clone targeted this problem. But it didn't target the problem this paper is trying to solve. So if you want to copy data from the source page to the destination page, you need to go through the processor, as you know. And this is a nice animation that shows that you keep doing it. <laughs> I like creative students who come up with these nice animations. <laughs> I don't have time to do this, but <laughs> it's good to do this when you're doing your PhD. <laughs> so clearly, this is long latency and high energy, right? We don't want to do that. Uh, moving data inside DRAM, uh, clearly row clone uh, provided a way to move data in, uh, inside a subarray. So this is a bank. A uh, bank consists of many DRAM cells, many subarrays. Row clone provides a very fast method to move data uh, within a subarray, a row to another row. But it didn't provide a method to move data between the subarrays. If you remember row clone, basically our proposal was, if you want to move a row or copy a row from this subarray to this subarray, you need to go through some other bank. Well, why? Uh, so this is 8 kilobytes. So you have a bunch of rows in the subarray. So the internal data bus over here is 64 bits. And that gets connected uh, to the uh, DRAM periphery, as you know. And as a result, you cannot move data from this subarray to this subarray without going through this internal data bus. Basically, you're back to the same problem. You're going to copy 8 kilobits from this subarray to this subarray. You have to go through the 64-bit bus. How do we fix that problem? Uh, and this is basically the key realization. Low connectivity in DRAM is the fundamental bottleneck for block data movement. 
So the goal of this work was to provide a new substrate to enable wide connectivity between subarrays. So uh, essentially, the idea is very simple. Uh, again, we're going to use isolation transistors. Uh, it turns out this is smaller based on some other results. Uh, essentially, if you have two subarrays like this, connect them with these isolation transistors that are visible to the memory controller, and the memory controller enables or disables them. And it turns out this is a versatile substrate. It doesn't enable block data moment. It enables block data moment. It reduces the copy latency between subarrays by a lot, about 10x. So this is very similar to intra subarray copy latency, but a little bit longer. And depending on the applications, you get significant speed ups and energy reduction. This also enables NDRAM caching. So if you have a big subarray that's slow and a fast subarray that's small, uh, you can enable NDRAM caching by moving, copying data from here to here. And that actually leads to a significant speed up. Of course, your caching mechanism needs to be well also. That's why we don't see a lot of speed up in terms of application performance. But you can see that the latency of access becomes much different. This also enables uh, the reduction of pre-charge latency by a lot. Why? Because now you have actually, uh, you, you can pre-charge a particular subarray from two, di two directions, not in one direction. I'll show you an example of this. So this is a versatile substrate that enables multiple things. That's one of the reasons I like it a lot. Let's take a look at how to actually move the data from one, one subarray to another. Essentially, you need a new command. It's called row buffer movement command. Uh, you move a row of data from an, in an activated row buffer to a pre-charged one. Let's take a look at this. You have two subarrays over here. This is the isolation transistors that we've added. Essentially, um, these are not enabled at this point. And assume that we've activated the subarray. This is pre-charged. There's nothing over here. Uh, once, we, once we activate, some row is enabled, and it's inside the sense amplifiers here. That's VDD over 2. That's VD divided by 2, because the bit lines are uh, pre-charged. Now, uh, we send a command saying row buffer, move the row buffer in subarray 1 into subarray 2. Now, what does this do? It enables the sense amplifiers. And once you enable the sense amplifiers over here, they share their charge with the bit line. They drive the bit line, essentially. Uh, the VDD, the strong sense amplifiers drive the bit line. And that becomes VDD over 2. And at some, uh, not, uh, that becomes, essentially, the shares charge. Little charge is shared. So this loses charge. This increases charge by, in this case, this amount. Uh, and sense amplifiers get enabled af soon after, and they amplify the charge. Right? So they become VDD in the end. I explained this too long, but essentially, because of charge sharing, this becomes VDD. So you copy the data that's here into here. And you've seen these principles before. They're, they're not going to change anytime soon. Uh, so this row buffer movement transfers an entire row between the subarrays as a result of this. Of course, now you can actually imagine multiple things, right? This is moving data between adjacent subarrays. But a DRAM has, let's say, I don't know, 128 subarrays. Let's, let's pick that number. You can move data from subarray 1 to subarray 127 over here by enabling these uh, isolation transistors uh, across all of those subarrays. Of course, that's not good, probably, because that takes a long time to move the data. So in this case, we actually analyzed that in the paper. Uh, if you want to increase the range of this robot for movement, uh, you basically want to look at this analysis. Uh, multiple robot for movements. Uh, enable uh, a moving of data between more than, for the more than three subarrays. Basically, we support row buffer movement across uh, these two subarrays. It turns out this is reasonable. You can do this, basically, in our design. But if you want to move from subarray 3 to subarray 4, for example, you need to do another row buffer movement command. That's the idea. So the limiter is really interconnect latency in the end. <laughs> you don't want to move from subarray 1 to subarray 4, because that interconnects, once you enable this, this, and that, uh, there are three isolation transistors you enable. Now the, uh, the, the interconnect becomes too long, meaning its capacitance increases. And as a result, uh, the charge sharing efficiency reduces. So it takes longer to actually move the uh, row buffer from this subarray all the way into subarray 4. And that analysis in the paper, it's actually fascinating to think about this. Basically, if you really want to uh, move data between more than, uh, for more than three subarrays, I think you need a different sort of interconnect. If you think about this, what we're doing is we're trying to move this data through a bus. It's a single bus. A bit line is a single bus. If you really want to move data much, more, much better 
across many, many subarrays, maybe you need to think about it differently, like have a mesh or have different types of connections. I don't know how to do that at this point in DRAM, but it's good to think about this going forward, how to interconnect memory cells better with each other. Because again, if, you, if I go back to nature, I'm not sure if nature really works this way, right? I'm not sure if there's a single bus between a single memory location to some other memory location. I don't know how it works, but <laughs> this, this, this feels a bit not so intuitive. Anyway, this, this is better than what we have today. And it turns out you can move four kilobytes of data in eight nanoseconds, even if you add more guard band into your uh, mechanisms. And essentially, you, uh, you, can, you can move data at 26x bandwidth, uh, at the 26x bandwidth of a DDR4-2400 channel, according to the results. Of course, these are technology dependent. Fundamentally, you can see that this is much faster and higher bandwidth compared to going through a narrow channel rate. Okay, and the DRAM chip area over is relatively small. Take these always with a grain of salt. I mean, it, in the, calculating the area overheads using the techniques that we have in academia, unfortunately, is not very easy. I can never fully trust our area overhead numbers. Uh, on the other hand, I cannot also fully trust what industry tells the area overhead numbers will be because they have a completely different mindset and they don't necessarily optimize. This is something that we do our best to get the chip area overheads, but this may actually be higher than 0.8%. I don't know. It also depends very much on the technology that's used to build those isolation transistors. Okay, so let's take a look at some of these applications quickly. Uh, so Lisa uh, leads to uh, multiple applications. One is rapid inter subarray copying. Essentially, the goal is to efficiently copy a row across subarrays, so you use RBM to form a new command sequence. So you first activate the source row, which brings the data into sense amplifiers. You do the RBM, which brings the data into uh, the sense amplifiers in the pre-charged subarray. And then you do the activate the destination row, which takes the data from here and puts it over here. That's the command sequence that you need to be able to do uh, essentially cloning of a row across subarrays. It's different from row clone. Row clone doesn't require this RBM, as you know. Right? And, but this leads to significant uh, improvement. Not as much as row clone, but it's pretty good actually across two subarrays. Okay, the, the second one is variable latency DRAM. Essentially, we want to do in DRAM caching in a different way than tiered latency DRAM. Uh, we want to reduce DRAM latency. Of course, we have a trade-off between area and latency. This is the long bit line, as we've seen. That's the short bit line, as we've also seen. This is, these are different pictures. Shorter bit lines are faster, as you know also. But this is high area overhead, actually. If you go this way, you get about 40% area overhead because you have all these additional peripheral structures that you add compared to this. So uh, the idea is to have a heterogeneous DRAM design, different from a tiered latency DRAM. There's another work that actually proposed this heterogeneous DRAM latency design. It's a good idea, I think. Uh, you basically add, and that's the work in ISCA 2013. Uh, basically, you have slow subarrays and fast subarrays, as I mentioned earlier. Fast subarrays, how is the data that are frequently accessed, hopefully? Now, the question is, how do you move a data from the slow subarray to the fast subarray? Uh, because there was no mechanism, this work that proposed this idea said the software is responsible for this. The software should map the data uh, appropriately. It may or may not be easy, depending on the application you have. In this case, Lisa enables a fast mechanism to move data from here to here, basically. Basically, you can cache rows rapidly from slow to fast subarrays because now you have isolation transistors that are connecting these subarrays. And it turns out you can reduce the hot data access latency by a lot with low area overhead in this case. And again, I'm not going to go through the details. You can look at the paper. This is another way of using LISA to actually reduce the latency uh, of pre-charge. So the pre-charge time is really limited by the strength of one pre-charge unit. So if you look at conventional DRAM, Precharge means that there is some precharge unit over there that sets the bit lines to VDD over two so that they can be prepared for next access. So it's a special unit. You can think of that as part of the sense amplifier also. Here we divide into sense amplifier plus precharge unit. Essentially, when you turn the precharge unit on, it changes the voltage, it drives the voltage and the bit line to VDD over two. And it's fundamentally limited by how fast you can uh, pump charge into uh, that bit line. So what Lisa enables is linked pre-charge, which is interesting. We didn't anticipate that when we were starting uh, thinking about doing this. Uh, but once you have the substrate of interconnected subarrays like this, 
you have this uh, interconnection, which is isolation transistors that are turned on. Now you, the realization is that you don't have a single precharge unit connected to this bit line. You have actually two precharge units connected to that bit line. So you can turn both of them on, and both of them, in a combined manner, do this link precharging. And it turns out, according to all our simulations, this reduces the precharge latency by a lot, like 2.6x, even with a high guard band. That's actually cool, I think. <laughs> this is something that we completely didn't anticipate uh, developing while we were doing this work. The goal was actually to overcome the limitations of rogue clone, that inter, uh, inter a copy. But the substrate enables actually much more than that. Why is it more than two? Uh, could you say it again? Why is it more than two? So it it's very interesting. The curve, because of the curve, because of the shape of the curve. The shape of the curve is if you, at some point, if you push more charge into it, your latency reduced a lot. <laughs> That's a very good question, though. <laughs> so if you have three, I don't know how this will happen, but I don't know how to do it with three, actually. <laughs> but you can guess, I guess, with, uh, yeah. That's a very good question. I think the shape of the curve is in the paper. Or, or at least our uh, circuit model is uh, public and you can <laughs> play with it. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that's it basically. I'm not gonna give you a result for applications. That's all you can read in the paper. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth in uh, this paper. But I think this is actually, uh, this paper is particularly interesting because I think it, it enables a different mindset in memory design. Basically, we need to in increase the interconnectivity inside a memory chip. And I think other methods to increase interconnectivity is very much needed in the memory chip. Uh, we haven't done anything, but this is an, a good area of research. How do you redesign the memory chip such that the interconnectivity is much better? That's going to be important for uh, in-memory processing also, in my opinion, because if you think about in-memory processing and uh, everything is far away from each other, one of the, uh, the, you run into this data mapping problem because data movement between different parts of memory is not fast, it's not cheap. As a result, you need to map your data nicely and then not move it, right? And then operate on your data locally. But if you have very fast methods of moving data inside a memory chip, data mapping problem becomes easier as well, right? Very similar to the arguments of row clone, right? Okay, and that's, that's where the source code is, so feel free to <laughs> play with it. Okay, so th let me give you an idea uh, that uh, we're publishing at ISCA in next week. I think this is going to be presented Monday uh, at ISCA in Phoenix. It's gonna be hotter than Vienna. I'm not looking forward to that. I think it's 41 degrees or something. That's <laughs> uh, so you're gonna enjoy Vienna, I think, <laughs> if you're here. So uh, this idea is very interesting. It's developed after years of research, of course, and this actually provides one of the lowest cost substrates. And again, this is a substrate to do multiple things, as you will see. And these are the slides that Hassan prepared for the lightning session. Essentially, there are multiple challenges of DRAM scaling, access latency, refresh overhead, and vulnerabilities to things like rope hammer, for example. And we wanted to have a substrate that, actually, the, the reason we started this to, uh, was to reduce access latency. But it turns out the substrate that's developed as a result of this uh, enables multiple things. So if you look at conventional DRAM, it looks like this. As you know, whenever you access a row, it goes directly into the sense amplifiers. So all rows are equal in the conventional DRAM. So this pro paper proposes the idea of copy rows. No isolation transistors. That's the difference from TLDRM over here. The cost is much lower. The idea is to have two different row decoders. These are called regular rows. And a very small fraction of the subarray is copy rows with a separate decoder, which is simple. Uh, now that you can enable multiple things, which is basically row copy operation. You activate this, which brings the data over here. And then you activate this one, which brings the data over here. It's very similar to tiered latency. This is a mind of its own. It's moving by itself, I think. That's something I don't like, but apparently my students like. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, basically this enables a row copy, as you've seen. It's very similar to tiered latency DRM without the isolation transistors. This also enables multiple row activation. Basically, you can concurrently activate this and this, and as a result, you can access much faster. So if you have the same data here and here, if you activate both of the rows at the same time, your charge sharing is much faster because you have the same data in both rows. And that reduces the latency of access to the same data. That's the idea. So you can use these uh, to build other stuff. So what are the other stuff? There are multiple use cases that are proposed in this work. I believe there may be other more. So Crow cache reduces access latency. The idea is to use this part as a cache. 
very similar to tiered latency DRAM. But the latency reduction doesn't come from the fact that this is inherently faster. In tiered latency DRAM, if you remember, this part is inherently faster because, okay, I'm going to stop this, sorry. <laughs> this is a bit annoying. I think it's using automated timings or something, right? Uh, how do we do this? Transitions. Anybody? Okay, it's in slideshow, I think. Yeah, I use timings. Now we use timings. Play narrations, now we do that. Okay. Now life is going to be better. <laughs> okay, I already said this. Uh, yeah, basically, uh, the latency reduction comes from the fact that the data over here in this row is exactly the same as the data in this row. So how do you do that? So whenever you activate a row over here, you also copy it over here using the row copy mechanism. And the next time you access that row because of a bank conflict later on or because of locality later on, there's some structure in the memory controller that says this row you're accessing is also in a copy row. So just activate both of them concurrently so that you can access things much at much faster latency. That's the idea over here. Of course, this requires some structures in the uh, memory controller. But uh, now you can reduce the latency significantly and the analysis in the paper uh, for that. Does that make sense? Uh, so basically, this gets rid of the, one of the big challenges with tiered latency DRAM, which is the isolation transistors. It pushes the complexity to the row decoder, but that's actually easier because you don't touch the array structure, you touch the peripheral circuitry. Usually, if you touch this array structure, it's harder to justify for especially a DRAM designer that's very, very conservative over there. <laughs> this touches uh, somewhere over here. Okay, so the, the other realization is that so th this was developed to reduce access latency, but it turns out the substrate enables reducing refresh overhead. How? So you may have a weak row over here. You, may, you profile your DRAM, figure out what rows are weak, what rows are strong, and we discuss profiling methods for that. You may have a weak row with a weak cell that cannot retain data for long over here. The idea is to remap that weak row. Whenever you need to access weak row, store the data into the strong row, assuming you have a strong row inside uh, the, this copy row area. So you never access that one. Whenever you uh, have the address, uh, need to access a row with that address, it's remapped to the strong row in the memory controller, and you supply the data from the strong row. This way you can increase the refresh interval across the board, assuming you have enough strong or enough, enough strong rows to weak the, uh, replace the weak rows. And our analysis shows that if you have enough uh, copy rows over here, you can replace the weak rows uh, that you have. And there's also a mechanism for protecting against row hammer uh, that this enables by remapping hammered rows to uh, these copy rows. Uh, so this could be used as a substrate. But I, I'm not really a big fan of this particular solution because I think there are simpler solutions that exist for row hammer, but you could use a substrate uh, certainly uh, to uh, protect against row hammer also. So the key result very quickly. Uh, essentially, if you use this caching latency reduction mechanism plus the refresh reduction mechanism with some configuration, you get significant speed up uh, and you get significant reduction in DRAM energy at very low cost in this case. So remember, tiered latency DRAM provided a DRAM chip area of 3% increase. This is actually a much lower cost. You lose some capacity, of course, just like in tiered latency DRAM because you're not able to use those copy rows for storing real data. You're really storing copy rows or uh, remapping the weak rows but that's the cost you pay. And the memory control overhead is not as much also over here. And if you're interested, the paper's already up on my website. Uh, and this is, I think, the state of the art at this point in terms of low latency DRAM, but it also has a nice structure. It's a substrate for actually doing many things, not just reducing latency. Uh, so yes. Uh, which one, uh, for, for the refresh reduction or the latency reduction? So latency reduction actually, uh, uh, in this case, again, it's a caching mechanism, right? You can decide whether you copy a particular uh, row over here into a copy row uh, if you have a good predictor. In this case, the results that we show is based on an LRU-based mechanism. Again, it's not a great caching mechanism, but even that improves performance. But I think you can actually, all of these substrates uh, what you cache 
inside this cache, uh, you, can, you can develop much better mechanisms. But we didn't want to go into that route because there are a lot of works that show that you can develop better caching mechanisms. But I think it, 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 it's a good idea to explore this one, for example, because I think this is very low cost. It could be adopted uh, more easily compared to other mechanisms that I described. Uh, and maybe there are much better caching mechanisms that improve the performance much higher. Right? Okay, so I've already discussed this. Any questions? So now that I've given you the latest work, <laughs> now I'll also talk about the first work that we, uh, that we started, uh, which is the sub -area level parallelism. I mentioned this, do you, do you guys remember this one? sub -area level parallelism, yeah. But I'll give you uh, the idea uh, in a little bit more detail over here. And again, our goal actually when we started this uh, was to reduce latency. But it's a different form of latency. It's f latency because you have bank conflicts. Uh, whenever you have bank conflicts, you have long latencies. Essentially, uh, that's cost, they're costly for performance and energy because you serialize the requests, you waste energy because when you have a bank conflict, you actually trash the row buffer, right? You, uh, imagine that you're accessing a, uh, row A and row B. Essentially, you're switching between the row buffer and that leads to a lot of trashing and leads to busy wait. You're serializing the requests. So our goal was to reduce the bank conflicts without adding more banks. Of course, adding more banks is one solution. Doing better address mapping is one solution, but that buys you limited benefits, and we do better address mapping in this. But of course, we want to do it at low cost. So the, this work uh, takes advantage of two observations. One is a DRM bank is divided into sub -rays that you very well know by now, but before this paper, it was not very well known. It's, it was, of course, always there, but it was not exploited, essentially. Um, and each subarray has its own local row buffer. We're going to take advantage of that. So this is a picture that I've shown you in a different way before. This is the picture of a logical bank. But physically, actually, you have subarrays. And each subarray has some number of rows and its own local row buffer. In this case, we show 64 subarrays over here. So that's the first observation. Uh, and the key ideas are uh, also the second observation is uh, subarrays are mostly independent of each other. So let's take a look at that. So if you look at the subarrays, they're connected via the global decoder and this global row buffer. And they own, uh, the operation over here is very independent of the operation over here, except they're tied with some global structures to reduce the cost. So you can decode only one address over here, for example. And if you want to decode another address that goes to some subarray, you need to ensure that this address is not uh, asserted. You assert some other address, basically. Okay, so the goal, a key idea of SALT was to minimally reduce sharing of these global structures such that you can enable as, as independent operation of these subarrays as possible. So we want to share, reduce the sharing of the global encoder. This enables almost parallel access to the subarrays, and I'm going to show you how we do that. Basically, whenever you have an address that goes to the subarray, latch it to a local, row buffer, uh, local, local latch over here such that you can now send another address to this subarray without disturbing the address in this subarray. That's the idea. Uh, and uh, basically, we want to utilize multiple local row buffers uh, by reducing the dependence on the global row buffer. So let's take a look at these ideas. Uh, so we want to, sh uh, this is uh, the current system. If you, if you look at a DRAM chip, you have a global decoder and you lash the address, and the address drives all of the subarrays. Of course, the address goes to only one subarray when we're activating a row. Uh, so instead of having one latch, one global latch, have per subarray latches. So we're going to push the latches inside the subarrays. That's the idea, very simple idea. Of course, it adds a little bit more complexity, but the benefits are hopefully worth it. Now, this enables you to keep the address over here while sending another address to another subarray, while sending another address to another subarray. Now, you can activate two things concurrently. Of course, concurrently is a stretch over here because you're really sharing the global decoder, so you really do it in a pipeline manner. Okay, the second um, thing, uh, second shared structure is the global bit lines or global row buffer. Essentially, the idea over here is uh, today, if you look at uh, a subarray, uh, because uh, the expectation is not such that you can, uh, uh, you can connect different subarrays to the uh, global bit lines at different cycles, only one subarray gets connected to the global bit lines. So we want to have a mechanism that breaks that, that selectively connects a local row buffer to global row buffer using some mechanism. So essentially, we add these switches. These switches enable separate connections 
between the sub arrays to the global bit lines. So how do we do that? We basically have these designated bit latches saying, this is a designated sub array that's currently going to drive the global bit lines. And if that bit is set to one, uh, the local row buffer of this sub array gets connected to the global bit lines. So let's assume that you want to read from this blue sub array that's already activated. That read sets the designated bit to one and this to zero and this gets connected so it drives the global bit lines. And if you want to read something else, you switch this out, basically turn off the switch, but you don't turn off the row buffer. It's still activated over there and you turn on the yellow switch when you read from the yellow subway. That's the idea. So you can basically independently connect these subways to the global bit lines. It turns out in existing DRAM, that's not the case because the expectation is that there's only one activated row. They don't have these switches. They don't have these designated bits. They basically connect the, there's a direct connection between this local row buffer to the global bit line. Therefore, you cannot activate two rows at the same time. Right, because if, you're, if you have one row activated, that's already driving directly the global bit lines because it's directly connected. So you cannot have two rows activated. You have a short, short circuit. So this actually adds these switches, which is a little bit more overhead, but it's not that bad actually. Okay, so of course you need a wire to uh, do this. So this is the baseline bank organization today. Uh, basically, we change that baseline bank organization to something which like this. So it's not a lot as you can see. <laughs> you go from here to here. But this is uh, some overhead, according to our calculations, 0.15%. I believe it's less than 1% for sure. <laughs> Maybe 0.15% is not fully correct, I don't know, because again, it's very hard to do. Uh, but it's not a lot, essentially. Okay, so uh, basically, let me give you the results over here, according to our uh, uh, results, but essentially we, this reduces bank conflicts a lot. As a result, it reduces energy in DRAM by 19%. It improves row buffer hit rate in DRAM. It also leads to significant system performance improvement. It's within 3% th of the ideal, all independent banks, basically. Instead of having, using these subways, if you made them completely independent banks, you get about 20%, but the overhead of that is a lot. Essentially, you need to replicate the row decoders, which is actually a very high area overhead. Uh, and, and the other peripheral structures for the bank. And if you're interested, you can read uh, more uh, the paper in more detail. And that's the paper. As I said, this is the first work that we've done uh, in DRAM uh, microarchitecture in general, along with Raider. It was published in the same conference in the same year, but we already, you already know about Raider. It's always good to have your work independently evaluated by someone else. These folks from Samsung and Intel actually propose, uh, evaluated this independently. And they actually, I'm not going to go through this in detail. You can look at Uxong Kang's slides from Samsung. Basically, they said that uh, we're, we, our latencies are increasing. So writes, for example, are a big problem for us uh, because of the contacts that you have between, uh, to the access transistor. Whenever you're driving uh, current inside the capacitor, it's taking a long time. And because of these increased latencies, we need to have mechanisms to tolerate these bank conflicts. While you're, after you write to a bank, if you want to do a read, you need to wait for that write to go through, right? So they said that you could actually use sub array level parallelism uh, while, uh, to relax the write latencies. Basically, they increase the write latency by 5x, for example. Uh, and this way, they can actually fix the reliability issues that they have. And sub array level parallelism could be one way of actually reducing the performance impact of increased write latencies. They use a very restricted form of sub array level parallelism over here, not, not the full blown sub array level parallelism that we propose. But even then, I think they show pretty good results. They basically say the performance is compensated, uh, meaning that they don't lose performance if, you, if they relax write latencies by 3x and even improved uh, by a 3% in this case. Take this with a grain of salt, of course. You cannot read this clearly, but you can read the paper. Uh, so I think that these ideas have impact, actually. Uh, we'll see if these ideas uh, will get implemented. DRAM interface is a bit hard to change because there's a lot of politics in JEDEC. JEDEC is the institute uh, that uh, essentially consists of all of the manufacturers plus many, many other people that decides what should the interface look like. And this uh, clearly changes the interface a little bit, so, so, subway level parallelism require some extra commands to DRAM to switch between subways, for example. Essentially, subways need to be visible to the memory controller. 
we'll see if that idea actually goes through. Samsung and Intel actually pushed for it very heavily for the DDR4 standard, but it didn't make it there. Even, even two companies that are pretty strong, they weren't able to push it to a standard. That, that should tell you something about the state of the art in the memory interface, right? <laughs> okay, but I think, I think this, these ideas are still quite good and at some point they will make uh, their way into, into the design of uh, memories. Uh, of course, I think some other idea. These are also very useful when you have in-memory computation, right? You want, when, you, when you do in-memory computation, you really want to do it at the sub-array level because that's where you get the highest parallelism. You want really independently operating sub-arrays in that case. Okay, where are we now? Any questions? I feel like it's getting hotter here. Is it good? Yeah, maybe not for everyone. <laughs> okay, so let's move to the second reason. Let's see how much we can cover in the remaining time. Uh, I think we've gone deeper into the DR microarchitecture. There's more to do in this area. But this part actually uh, is, is maybe even easier to adopt, at least some of the ideas over here. Because we have actually a one-size-fits-all approach to latency specification, independently of the DRM architecture internally. Uh, and I call this the fixed latency mindset. Basically, the reliable operation latency of memory is actually very heterogeneous. There's no one size. It's very heterogeneous. It's dependent on temperature, chips, parts of a chip, voltage levels, whatever else you may imagine over here. So our idea is to dynamically find out and use the lowest latency one can reliably access a memory location with. So ideally, you would like to exploit that heterogeneity. You would like to know the reliable operation latency for a given cell or row or column uh, at different temperatures, at different voltage levels, and use that minimum latency, uh, that minimum reliable latency that you can access that cell with. Of course, we're not going to start with that complicated idea. We're going to start simpler. And I'm going to talk about, develop some ideas over here. The first idea is adaptive latency DM. We'll see that. And then we're going to make the ideas more sophisticated as time goes on. And this is a, a simple timeline of the development of the ideas. And later, I think this leads to some interesting ideas like once you start trading off, once you start understanding the relationship between reliability and access latency and voltage, now you can start developing some really, really interesting ideas like the paper that I assigned uh, as an optional reading. Okay, basically, uh, we would like to find the source of latency heterogeneity and exploit them to minimize latency or create some other benefits. And in this case, uh, we're not going to explicitly change the microarchitecture to create heterogeneity. Uh, that was a different approach. That was the first approach. Uh, here, we're going to exploit the heterogeneity that is present already in the system. So what is that heterogeneity? So uh, this is one card, uh, pictorial example. So this is read on latency. Left is low, right is high. Um, essentially, you have a distribution. Some DRAM chips are lower latency by nature because of manufacturing conditions. Some DRAM chips are higher latency by nature. And even within a DRAM chip, you have some latency distribution. This is, of course, a pictorial view, right? It doesn't have to be a normal distribution like that. We actually show these distributions in some of the papers. But uh, there are some slow cells in a DRAM chip. Uh, there are some fast cells in a DRAM chip. And there are some slow cells. Why? Because it turns out this cell has very little charge. And it takes, uh, takes it uh, a long time to share the charge with the bit line. Its access transistor is too uh, resistive. As a result, that turns out to be a slow cell. There are multiple reasons for slowness, as we will discuss. But some cells are big, and uh, they have a lot of charge. Their access transistors are very strong. As a result, they can be fast. Right? So this is latency variation, essentially. So why is latency high in this case? Essentially, DRAM latency is the delay that's specified in the DRAM standards. It really doesn't reflect the true DRAM device latency. It's somebody's standard, right? Somebody said uh, between an activate uh, and another activate, you need to wait for 55 nanoseconds. And this is set uh, uh, across a lot of political discussions <laughs> in JEDEC, let's say. Uh, why? Because it's set that way because people think they can set uh, a large number of companies can satisfy that latency, including the memory manufacturers, memory controller manufacturers that don't manufacture DRAM. They can satisfy that latency at acceptable yield. So they can basically make profit out of this business. <laughs> but it doesn't really reflect the true DRAM device latency. 
uh, in, because of the imperfect manufacturing process, you get latency variation. So this, I like this picture a lot, basically. Yeah, manufacturing variation. As a result, uh, you get uh, a huge variation in terms of latency. And usually, latency is picked somewhere to the right. And you get this high standard latency so that DRM manufacturers can manufacture many, many different types of chips, and they're all acceptable. That maximizes the yield, as you can see. Only the chips that are really at the edge of this distribution over here are not acceptable if they're found through testing, of course, right? It's also very interesting, right? This could give you the ideas, okay, maybe there are some chips that are to the right end over here, especially at aggressive conditions. I'm not sure if that's easy to find, though. Okay, so what caused uh, the wrong, long memory latency? Basically, you have conservative timing margins because of the picture I showed you. The EM timing parameters are set to cover the worst case. What is this worst case? It's really worst case temperatures. There is a promised operation temperature of DRAM. It's 85 degrees Celsius. Depending on the DRAM type, it may go to 95 degrees Celsius. But the common case is really not the worst case. Uh, the DRAM in my laptop is not operating at 85 degrees Celsius. I'm pretty sure of that. But my laptop is dying, so probably, <laughs> I don't know, may, maybe there's something, something we are going on. Don't trust my laptop. I think I'm losing one key uh, per week. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is used to enable a wide range of operating conditions, of course, right? Uh, also, worst case devices, essentially DRAM cell with the smallest charge across any acceptable device determines the latency. The goal is to really maximize yield, make all of these chips acceptable in the field, right? And this leads to large timing margins for the common case. So basically, we wanted to understand and exploit this variation in DRAM latency. So to be able to understand what we do, we actually build, uh, use our infrastructure as we will see. And you know all of this, so I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. There are three steps of charge movement in DRAM, uh, which is activation, which brings data into the sense amplifiers. That's sensing. You need to do the sensing to activate, and you need to do the restoration. That's sensing and restoration together is part of the activation. You basically activate a row, sense amplifier senses the data, and then drives the uh, data back into the cells. That's the restoration. And then you need to do the pre-charging, of course, right, to prepare the cell for the next uh, array for the next access. Let's take a look at how this uh, works as a timeline of the charge uh, between the sense amplifier and the cell. Initially, the cell is charged, assume that, and the sense amplifier is VDD over two, basically. So this is sense amplifier, that's the cell. You send an activate, cell shares the charge with the sense amplifier, sense amplifier at some point kicks in, <laughs> starts driving the charge, driving the bit line, and also the cell. And at some point, the cell gets restored completely. In theory, this is the point where you can read the cell. Actually, this is, even this is uh, conservative. You can read the cell somewhere over here. You don't need to wait until it's 100% VDD charged. You can read it reliably over here. That's fine. In theory, uh, you can do it here, but in practice, you have a lot of margin. That's where the margin is. Basically, DRM manufacturers tell you you should wait some number of nanoseconds to be able to read the cell. But the cell is already ready. You can really read it because it's charged over there. The key question is how do you know this, right? If you can measure the charge in a cell, of course, you can know this, but that's destructive, as we know. Uh, but, uh, okay, but we're not going to know this. We're going to uh, guess this, uh, as we will see. Why does DM uh, need the extra timing margin? Let's take a look at that. And there are two reasons, as we've discussed. One is process variation, and the other is temperature dependence. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. DM cells are not equal, as we know, and that leads to extra timing margin for a cell that can actually be accessed fast or store a large amount of charge. So let's basically, uh, ideally, you have same size, same charge, same latency in all cells, but real life is very different. So you have large variation in cell size. As a result, this largest cell is much faster, whereas this small cell should be accessed much slower because it takes a long time for this to actually drive the circuits. And yeah as we've discussed. So why does this happen? Let's go a little bit more into detail. So if you look at a DRAM cell, this is one picture of it. Uh, the capacitor, as I said, is vertical, like this. And then you have contact, you have access transfer, and then you have the bit line. Look, the circuit actually looks like this. Whenever you access, you're really connecting the bit line to the capacitor through the contact and through the access transistor. And what plays a role in terms of the process variation is it affects the capacitance of the cell, clearly. It affects the contact resistance. And it affects the transistor performance, which is also complicated, right? It's not just that. There's also a bit line performance over here, which we ignore over here. 
because multiple cells are connected to the bit line. So a small cell can restore, store small charge. It has small cell capacitance. It has high, uh, so a small cell can, so essentially small cell has uh, multiple meanings. It's not just small. Uh, a cell that's slow, uh, this, these are the characteristics of a very slow <laughs> cell essentially. You have small cell capacitance. You have high contact resistance over here. It takes a long time uh, to chair the charge. And you have a slow access transistor. And if you have all of these, that's really your slowest cell, perhaps. Of course, it's a compli complicated combination, right? It's very hard to measure all of these and for every single cell in DRAM. But these are the cells that lead to high access latency. And there are not that many of them, as we will see. Uh, of course, it depends on the chip as well. So the temperature is an orthogonal dimension that leads to a timing margin. Uh, DRAM leaks more charge at higher temperature, which means that DRAM uh, is slower to access at higher temperatures in general. This leads to extra timing margin for cells that operate at low temperature as a result. So this is another pictorial view. At room temperature, everything is cool. At high temperature, everything is hot. You have small leakage over here. You have large leakage over here. And cells store charge. Uh, small charge at high temperature and large charge over here. So this, you can access things much faster, hopefully. So you have a large variation access latency because the, 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 uh, the specification is for high temperatures, not for low temperatures. So essentially, DRAM timing parameters are dictated by the worst case, and we've already discussed this, the small cell in acceptable DRAM products and operating at highest temperature. So you get a large timing margin for the common case. And essentially, once you observe that, it's easy to develop an idea, right? The idea is very simple in adaptive latency DRAM. You optimize the DRAM timing for the common case. What is common case? Current temperature, current DRAM module. So why would this reduce latency? As we've discussed, that in the common case, at low temperature with strong cells, you can store much more charge. More charge means faster sensing, faster charge restoration, faster pre-charging, which essentially means faster access. Read, write, refresh. Even refresh becomes faster, actually, since refresh is same as an activate, right? And we're going to make activate and pre-charge uh, faster. So essentially, if you have extra charge, you get lower sensing latency. You get lower restoration latency because you don't need to fully restore cells with extra charge, right? This cell is huge. You don't need to fully restore it because it's not the bottleneck. It has a lot of margin in terms of charge. You can restore it a little bit, and then the next time you're going to read, it's going to be perfectly fine. Does that make sense? So you can do partial restoration, essentially. Uh, and pre-charge also, you can do partial pre-charging. You don't need to fully pre-charge bit lines for cells with extra charge. There's lower pre-charge latency. That's a bit harder to do, of course. OK, so we actually characterize real DRAM chips, many real DRAM chips, with our infrastructure. That's the benefit of the infrastructure. We didn't imagine doing these studies when we built the infrastructure. But now you can actually uh, characterize these uh, uh, latency characteristics, and you can do it on your own also. If you don't believe the results, feel free to do it on your own. But I think you'll find that the results are going to be similar. <laughs> uh, unless the DRAM chip doesn't enable you to do the studies. And there are some DRAM chips uh, that are a bit annoying, I think. <laughs> uh, they're, they're, uh, sometimes they lock out, uh, and they don't allow you to reduce the latency beyond some uh, value. I don't think this is good. but. I don't know, I don't control the manufacturers. <laughs> I think we can have a lot of discussion about manufacturers sometime. <laughs> I think the issue is really with the mindset, that that somehow needs to change. Uh, and I think that's going to change. Don't worry. It'll take time maybe, but it's going to change. <laughs> because they, they will need to make money at some point, and they will figure out the current mindset is not going to lead to more money. OK, so let's look at the uh, observations. So faster sensing. The typical DRAM at low temperature stores more charge. So you have strong charge flow, so you can do faster sensing. And we found out across 115 DIMMs, you can reduce the activation latency significantly, 17%. In some DIMMs, of course, you can reduce much more. And you get no errors, basically. And we ran these for a really long time, and you don't get a lot of errors. Essentially, you can reduce the sensing uh, latency. Okay, reducing restoration time, uh, you get less leakage uh, at low temperature as a result of extra charge, so you don't need to fully restore the charge whenever you're doing the restoration. And we actually see significant, even more significant reductions over here through the TRAS, read latency, and TWR, write recovery latency. You can reduce them on average across these 115 DIMMs by 37 and 
and you get no errors essentially on the chips because we're operating at low temperature. It's about 55 degrees Celsius or lower. And we're not ensuring that we're operating at that low temperature. We're not controlling temperature actually. It, it happens that the temperature is not that high. Uh, okay, we already discussed this. So the key idea of ALDM, once you have these observations, is to optimize DRAM timing parameters online. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, so this is one incarnation of the idea. There are two components. Somebody uh, provides multiple sets of reliable timing parameters at different temperatures for each dip. And the system monitors DRAM temperature and uses appropriate DRAM timing parameters for that particular dip. So somebody needs to profile DRAM and figure out reliable timing parameters, as opposed to having a single set of timing parameters at 85 degrees Celsius. Add one more set. Let's assume that uh, that's for 55 degrees Celsius. If you're operating below 55 degrees Celsius, use this set of parameters. If you're operating above, use the current set of parameters. It's not that hard, actually. It's very simple uh, to do, except it increases the testing cost, of course, as we will discuss. And the system monitors the DM temperature and uses the appropriate DM timing parameters. This requires, of course, uh, some way of monitoring DM temperature. This already exists in DM chips, actually. But I'm not going to go through that but you can find actually documentation for it. And somebody needs to provide the reliable DRAM timing parameters. Okay, let's take a look at uh, some evidence of DRAM temperature. So we actually uh, did a lot of measurements on DRAM temperature and basically in many cases you don't operate at 85 degrees Celsius. And previous works actually also provide evidence that DRAM temperature is low in general. Now this may change if you're doing in-memory computation of course. So think about that going forward. But uh, DRAM temperature is relatively low and also previous work tried to maintain low DRAM temperature for multiple reasons, to reduce energy, because they want to operate the data centers at cool temperature, they try to maintain low DRAM temperature. So in the common case, DRAM operates at lower temperatures than the maximum. And this is the latency reduction summary for 115 DIMMs. That's almost 1,000 chips, basically. You can reduce the overall read latency by about 30%, and overall write latency by about 55% at 55 degrees Celsius. Again, averaged across all of the DIMMs that we've, all of the chips that we've tested. There's clearly a distribution. Some, in some cases, you can reduce it by 75% because chip happens to be very strong. In some cases, you can reduce it by very little because chip has, happens to be very weak. And this is the latency reduction that we get for each parameter. You can read the paper. And actually, we open sourced all of the results. All of the DIMMs results are somewhere online. Uh, but this is also four years ago, so it's a bit older chips. So we actually did real system evaluation uh, to test these ideas. It's not exact idea that we described. We, we cannot dynamically change the timing parameters in a real system, at least in this real system. But we can change the timing parameters in the BIOS. Basically, you can change the timing parameters, uh, for example, row precharge time, row activate time uh, in the BIOS over here. And that's essentially what we did. Uh, and we operated the system at less than 55 degrees Celsius, which was very easy to do. <laughs> You don't actually need to do much, it just operates. Uh, and none of the applications actually took us beyond 55 degrees Celsius uh, in this case. And if you actually use the timing parameters that we tested on our FPGA for the given DIM, these are the performance improvements that we get. You get basically significant performance improvement. This is single core. In single core applications, you can improve performance by about 7%, which is not bad for single core applications. Uh, uh, for memory intensive ones. GUPS is an interesting application, giga updates per second. It's actually a random access application. People use this application to test HPC random access performance. Uh, there's also streaming applications somewhere over here. Uh, so basically, you can get significant performance improvements. And we ran these applications for a really long time. You don't get any errors in the system. And uh, multi-core evaluation, of course, when you have multiple cores accessing memory, latency becomes even more important because things get delayed a lot more. So the performance improvements are even higher when you, for example, have four copies of GUPS or four copies of uh, each of these applications. Actually, GUPS is interesting. You don't get a whole lot of higher performance because it's completely random and it floods the memory. It doesn't matter if you're running one copy versus four copies in the system. Uh, so you get about 14% performance improvement uh, for intensive workloads. Okay, and this is, these are results on a real system. There's also simulations that we do to show other types of benefits of this adaptive latency DM, but for that, I'll refer you to the paper. 
uh, these are some preliminary results. I think there needs to be more analysis over here, but reducing latency is good for many things, not only for performance, but it's also good for reducing power consumption. And we, uh, according to our evaluations, this is not real system results, this is evaluation based on some circuit simulation. We can actually reduce the DRAM power consumption by about five to 6%. And the major reduction is you're really not driving uh, these uh, rows and bit lines for long. You're driving them for short. As a result, they're not consuming, expending as much energy. Similarly, if you're, uh, you're reducing pre-charging energy, but we don't have the results over here. Essentially, reducing the latency reduces energy as well, which I think is a good thing in general. I think this is a very good system design principle. Start with low latencies and then build the system that way. Uh, and I think this is a low-cost way of reducing latency. Of course, even low-cost ways have disadvantages, we will see. So let me cover this. Uh, I guess no one's waiting yet, so maybe we'll go a little bit <laughs> over time. So this is a very simple mechanism to reduce latency. I think this is the simplest mechanism that we discussed so far. Uh, you just need to provide a different set of timing parameters. And if you want to do even more, you go to multiple sets, of course. Uh, it gives you syst significant system performance and energy benefits, and benefits are higher at lower temperatures. Maybe at zero degrees Celsius, you get even better benefits, but we haven't tested that. It's low cost and low complexity. Disadvantage, of course, there is always a disadvantage, right? Because someone needs to determine these reliable operating latencies, right? Uh, for different tempers and different temps. So you'll, at least it's higher testing cost, but there is no free lunch. You have to pay something to get something, and somebody needs to pay that testing cost. I don't think it's actually that difficult for low temperatures. We actually assume a lot of margin, even at low temperatures. So we're not operating at no slack position. We're really operating still, there's a timing margin that we're assuming, but that timing margin uh, is the same as what's assumed at high temperature, essentially. But at low temperature, I think testing is easier at low temperatures, frankly. All of the testing that we've done at low temperatures is a lot easier. There's a lot more slack over there. And this is the paper, and you can see that there's a link for full data sets if you want to know a particular dem. But this is an old, relatively old work right now, so it's, uh, but we repeated these experiments with other, uh, as we will see with other uh, devices as well. Yes, please. One them. That's a very good question. I don't remember. <laughs> it takes a while. <laughs> so it's, it's the, range, the range of hours, yes. But I think uh, actually pro uh, d uh, developing mechanisms to do this profiling much faster is a good idea. And I'm going to talk about something uh, that reduces that uh, characterization cost. You can actually do this on your own. Uh, this, this idea is implementable in a real system also, assuming that you uh, you're able to change the uh, latencies in the BIOS, right? Yeah. You just reboot your system, change the latencies, and keep testing your memory. <laughs> and actually, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great idea, actually. I agree with you. This could be done in runtime. Because once you start getting errors, you back off, right? Yeah. I like that. Maybe you can do it. <laughs> also, I think this is an intuitive idea. Uh, I, some, uh, how many of you are gamers over here? Avid gamers? Oh, not anymore? When you, were, when you were an avid gamer, did you actually reduce the latencies of your system? Sure, there you go. <laughs> so people do it all the time, actually, and they see, I don't know, did your system crash? Not after I was doing the testing. <laughs> I see, so you did some testing, basically, right? Yeah, exactly. So people do it uh, in an ad hoc manner to improve their performance, because they need performance. Basically, this is a more uh, standardized manner, essentially, that's what, what we're proposing. Of course, I think how to do the latency profiling is going to be more important going forward. You want, people, you want this to be done automatically for all systems, I think. Okay, so let's, let's talk about uh, a little bit more. Basically, ALDRM exploits latency variation across time, different temperatures, and across chips. Right? Now, now, one of the next questions that we asked was, is there also latency variation within a chip? And the answer should be obviously yes, right? <laughs> across different parts of a chip, and how do we exploit it? So this is a little bit more new results. This is the results from many, many rounds across many, many chips, as you can see. Uh, 
This is the uh, activation latency and this is the bit error rate that you get. And the standard is 13 nanoseconds, 13.1 nanoseconds. As you can see, you don't see errors if you keep reducing things to 10 nanoseconds. And uh, I, I put the uh, boundary over here because our testing uh, sensitivity is only 2.5 nanoseconds. We can actually reduce the latency at 2.5 nanosecond time steps uh, in our memory controller. And this is where things start happening. <laughs> Essentially, once you reduce the latency to 7.5 nanoseconds, you get this distribution across many rounds and many chips uh, in terms of bit error rate. So there are some cases where you don't get a lot of bit errors in the chips. Maybe they're tolerable, right? Maybe you were getting errors in your uh, application, but maybe you weren't noticing <laughs> if you reduce it. But there are some cases where you're getting a lot higher error rates. So if you reduce it to 7.5 nanoseconds, you actually uh, get this distribution. So you get different characteristics across different DIMMs. And if you reduce it too much, then you get a lot of errors. Uh, so these DIMMs actually have very few errors. These DIMMs have many, many errors, and this is rife with errors. So we've already seen this. Modern DRAM chips exhibit significant variation in activation latency. So it turns out there's a lot of variation inside the DRAM chip also. This is a spatial locality of activation errors. These are rows, these are cache lines. So as you can see that activation errors are concentrated at certain columns of cells over here. So if you can somehow identify those columns and do something with them, maybe a different ECC, uh, maybe you map your data such that you don't access those columns much, then you can reduce the latency a lot also. And that's the idea over here. And essentially these dark bars say uh, these are the cache lines that are experiencing the errors and these are the rows. Uh, these are the XY coordinates that are experiencing errors. And this is a density plot again. Darker means more errors, essentially. So you don't see a lot of errors actually if you look over here. This is TRCD 7.5 nanoseconds. This is a single bank. Most of the bank is still perfectly operational. There are only some cache lines that experience a lot of errors, as you can see, because they happen to be weak. Of course, we don't exactly know why they're weak, but those bit lines happen to be weak. So the observation in this work is DRAM's timing errors or slow DRAM cells are concentrated on certain regions. And the idea is very simple once you have this. It's uh, flexible latency DRAM, a software transparent design that reduces latency by dividing memory, re memory into regions of different latencies. And the memory control uses lower latency for regions without slow cells and higher latency for other regions. So two, two kinds of timing, high latency, low latency. You use the high latency for regions with slow cells. You use the low latency for regions without the slow cells. Now you're at the mercy of what fraction of the cells are fast, what fraction of the cells are slow. And we see two timing parameters over here. There's more in the paper. And this is the fraction of cells for a particular uh, three types of DIMMs. So this is baseline. Everything is assumed to be 13 nanoseconds, as you can see over here, both TRCD and TRP. This DIMM one, you can see that uh, most of the cells can be operated without errors at 10 nanoseconds, which is already uh, faster over here, faster than 13 nanoseconds. But a small fraction of cells can be operated uh, at 7.5 nanoseconds. That's not a bad DIM, but this DIM is even better. You can see that most of the cells can be operated at 7.5 nanoseconds, and a small fraction have to be operated at 10 nanoseconds. And this DIM is even better. I think not more than 99% of the cells over here can be operated at 7.5 nanoseconds, and a very small fraction have to be operated at 10 nanoseconds. That's the idea over here. And this is true for TRP also. So DIMMs clearly have different profiles, but within a DIMM, you have different profiles also. Oh, okay, I have the numbers over here. That makes life a little bit easier. <laughs> of course, there are many, many DIMMs. Upper bound here is uh, assuming all of the cells in a DIMM uh, can be operated at 7.5 nanoseconds without errors. So we're gonna compare to this upper, upper bound. That's called low latency DRAM, and the latency is 7.5 nanoseconds for each of these parameters. So clearly, this is going to get very close to the upper bound, right? But even this is going to get close, and it's not too bad. So, okay, these are the results. I'm not going to go through the details of how to, this actually has, uh, this paper has a lot of interesting observations. If you're really interested in the observations, I would recommend reading it. Uh, uh, I actually like Sigmetrics as a conference. Sigmetrics is uh, the uh, uh, premier performance evaluation and measurement uh, of systems conference. And they're actually very interested in this sort of understanding system studies. Uh, 
and we also did this simulation to figure out what is the performance improvement that you would get if you actually exploit uh, this phenomenon over here. So uh, in the baseline, you, that's the normalized performance across 40 workloads, and you can read the paper for more detail. This particular DIM that has a small fraction of cells that can be operated at 7.5 nanoseconds and the rest 10 nanoseconds, it's still, you still get 13% performance improvement if you exploit this variation. But a better DIM, you get even higher performance improvement. A better DIM, you get even higher performance improvement. And this is the upper bound. If you're able to operate all of the cells at 7.5 nanoseconds without errors, you get about 20%, 19.7. And this DIM that's really strong if you will, get you almost there. Right? I think this is very interesting. The, your performance now depends on which DIM you get. Uh, this actually, sometimes we actually uh, talk with a lot of manufacturers to implement this idea, and they sometimes say this is not good because you sell a phone to someone, someone X, and you sell it to someone Y, and they get different performance. And now they start complaining to each other, right? I don't know, I don't solve this problem, but it could be a real problem. But maybe you sell the phones for different prices then, right? People who want the faster phone uh, gets this phone <laughs> and they pay more, I don't know. I'm not gonna go into the marketing of it. I'm not a marketing researcher. I want to understand the fundamentals of it. Someone else can figure out how to market this if that's the goal. I think this could be used for other goals also, of course, not just making money, right? Okay. Okay, basically, uh, if you exploit this spatial latency variation inside a DRAM chip, you can improve performance. That's the key takeaway over here, and there's significant latency variation inside a DRAM chip. Of course, the complexity is now higher, right? Because you, you, need, to have, uh, no, uh, you need to have mechanisms for figuring out how to exploit this. Okay, maybe somebody's coming in soon. Yeah, they're looking. Let's see. <laughs> so the big advantage is this reduces latency significantly. It exploits significant within chip latency variation. The disadvantage is you need to determine reliable operating latencies for different parts of a chip. So your testing cost is higher. And you need more complicated controller, actually. This paper doesn't tackle with these problems, but there is a disadvantage here. And if you really want to uh, know this, I would recommend reading this paper. It's not something I assign because there are too many papers to assign, but let's see. We still have a couple of reviews to assign, right? <laughs> Okay, so let me finish this part because it'll be a very natural stop uh, because we did more study after this to understand the phenomenon. And we wanted to ask the question, how are activation failures spatially distributed in DRAM? So you see this, if you actually push the DRAM uh, to its boundaries, you see this sort of failure patterns. This is one subarray, this is another subarray, and different subarrays have different columns that are failing. So essentially, activation failures are highly constrained to local bit lines. And these are LPDDR chips, actually. This is low power chips. Uh, they see more errors, it turns out. So we also wanted to ask the question, does a bit minus probability of failure change over time? Because you profile the chip, you figure out some failure probability. If it changes after two hours, then you have a problem, right? The, essentially, do you have variable latency time? You, know, you remember the variable retention time and retention that exists? Do we have this variable latency phenomenon? And we found out that a weak bit line is likely to remain weak, and a strong bit line is likely to remain strong over time. And this is a fancy picture that shows the failure probability at time T1 and failure probability at time T2, where T1 and T2 are completely different. And this shows that it's very, they're very well correlated with each other for different cells. So you just need to tolerate that margin, basically, as you can see. And this is across many, many uh, chips. So uh, we can rely on a static profile of weak bit lines to determine whether an axis will cause failures. Now take this with a grain of salt static profile for some time. I don't believe in static profiles in general. I think you, because there are many, many effects that you cannot test for, right? Like aging, for example, like how, do, how, do, how does aging affect these things after five years? Clearly, you cannot uh, test for these easily. So I think you need to dynamically reprofile your system once in a while, but you, this can remain static for some time, for a good amount of time, let's say uh, 15 days or so, according to our tests over here. So the next one is how are right operations affected by reduced TRCD? This is actually really interesting, I think. You may have weak bit lines over here. You activate, you get the data. Now you do a write to an activated row. You just need to write to there, right? Essentially, your writes could be actually uh, fine. Uh, they can go very quickly. So essentially, you can reliably issue write operations with significantly reduced activation latencies because you're not really waiting for things to be activated. You're really driving the circuits in some other way, right? 
you're not really uh, going to read the data that's going to come out of these bit planes. That's the idea. So write operations are special. We don't take advantage of it in existing systems. You can reduce the write latencies by a lot uh, because writes don't need to wait for activation, essentially. At least not full activation, right? You need to wait at least somewhat so that you don't uh, go into a metastable state. But as long as you avoid that metastable state, you're fine. So the idea in solar DRAM is, uh, this is the latest work in this topic, it's a static, use a static profile, static for some time, of weak subarray columns. It identifies subarray columns as weak or strong. And there are three components. There are variable latency cache lines, reordered subarray columns, and reduced latency for writes. Let's take a look at these very quickly. So you identify cache lines comprised of strong bit lines. These are some cache lines that are weak, weak lines, and these are strong bit lines. And you access such cache lines with a reduced TRCD. That's the idea. You need to record this somewhere, and I think you can do it. It's not that bad. But of course, it's additional complexity compared to what we previously discussed. Reordered subarray columns, it's also a simple idea. You have cache line zero and cache line one over here. You remap the cache line across DRAM at the memory controller so that cache line zero will likely map to uh, a strong cache line. So cache line zero is the first one you're accessing. Uh, whenever you reduce the activation latency, uh, the, uh, you actually uh, are likely to destroy the data for the first cache line you're accessing. So if the first, line, first cache line you're accessing is a strong, uh, um, are strong bit lines, you can reduce the activation latency. That's the idea over here. And the last one is reduce latency for writes, exploit, uh, exploit what we've discussed. Uh, essentially, all bit lines are strong when you're issuing the writes. You don't think of them as weak because you're really driving the uh, uh, cache lines over here. Uh, you don't need to wait for activation, essentially. That's the idea. You don't need to wait for most of the activation latency because write mechanism is in operating independently of the activation over here. Okay, and that's the uh, latest work. It, essentially, if you're interested in reading it, we publish this in a nice CD, or you can watch the talk video. <laughs> and this is actually done on really state-of-the-art LPDDR4 chips, uh, different from the results that we've discussed. But it's a, essentially, fundamentals are very similar. The observations remain. Uh, but how to exploit those observations are a little bit different over here. Okay, I've gone very quickly for the last one, but I think we have a deadline to meet. Any questions? There are people who are circling around and trying to see if they're opening the door. So maybe we should open the door for them. No questions? Did we have a required reading on latency? Who, who says yes? Okay, some people. Who says no? Who's completely opposed to this idea? No one. Okay, are you raising your hand? No, not yet. Okay, I guess let's, let's stop it here and we'll meet tomorrow. Thank you.